Simply Financial with Christopher Calandra, Certified Financial Planner, is an innovative, comprehensive, informative, and cutting-edge podcast that discusses financial topics ranging from personal finance, economics, politics, and personal growth. Simply Financial will cover intriguing and thought-provoking questions so that the listener can simply increase their financial IQ. Welcome to the Simply Financial Podcast. This is your host, Christopher Calandra. We are in season number three, and this is episode number six. On today's episode, I have a guest, Nick Raffel, who is a fellow podcaster focusing on real estate investors, and I'm looking forward to our discussion today because I like to invest in real estate investing. I think it's a key part of wealth building, and he's in a great position. Not only does he have the podcast, but his business is focused on providing marketing and consulting help to real estate investors in that community. So, Nick, thanks for joining me today. Chris, thank you very much for having me on the show. So your podcast is Seven Rules for Real Estate Investing, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Beautiful. And I will say, as as we begin to get into this, I've been doing this for... I uh, I don't know, maybe we've done 80 or so episodes of the Simply Financial podcast thus far, and I think this is the first time I've had a guest on that has their own podcast, so this is a first for me. I'm happy to uh, to be the first and share everything we're doing on the show with you and your audience. Yeah, so to begin with, why did you decide to launch a podcast focused on real estate investing? A couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons being that in the marketing and consulting work you mentioned that I'm involved in, I'm working with real estate investors and helping them to get their own professionally published book in just seven hours of their time. So through that experience and the various projects we've worked on with these investors have gotten to meet a variety of different people in different niches within real estate investing as an industry. And the podcast is coming in then as a way to turn valuable conversations that me and the members of my team are having with these people into something that's publicly available and that can hopefully educate people, including your listeners, on real estate investing so they can, if they're interested, potentially get involved in it too. That's terrific. And uh, having listened to uh, most of your episodes, I don't know about all, I I like the format that you've included a lot of different versions of real estate investing. I think a lot of people, when you mention real estate investing, uh, they'll think of you know flipping a property, I think in part because of some of the popular flipping TV shows that have happened over the last few years. But they'll think of flipping, they'll think of you know buying a house and renting it out. But there's many, many different ways you could do real estate investing. For example, uh, one episode that you had a guest on recently specialized in investing in uh, storage unit real estate. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We had a guy by the name of Scott Myers, who that's his thing, buying self-storage units and uh, investing and teaching people about that. And then there was another one that, again, these are areas that I don't have familiarity with and probably for most people it doesn't come... Uh, to mind first when you think about real estate investing, but you had another guest on and talked about something related to farmland? Yeah, Russell Gray of The Real Estate Guys, talking about he, how he and his partners have become involved in various aspects of farmland as an investment. All right, very good. So part of the reason why I wanted to, to have you on, as I, I said at the top of the show, is that If we assume someone is starting out in real estate investing, and I know many of the people you've come into contact with are professionals where that's their primary source of income and wealth building, but let's just for purposes of of my audience and where I want to take the discussion, let's assume someone is starting to look at the idea of investing in real estate as part of their wealth building. Uh, How should they prepare? What should they do early on as they get started? Well, I like how you put that in context of being part of their wealth building. Because as long as you think about it in that sense, 
then you're probably correct to think about real estate. And what I mean with that is that anyone who does consider real estate should have some context in which they're thinking about it as a means toward an end. With that, the first step then to answer your question more fully would be that anyone who is looking at real estate should have their, have their big why and their reason for why they want to do it. Not just that, but also have a clear sense of what their goals are with real estate investing. Are they doing it, for example, as a way to be able to spend more time with their family? Or are they doing it to secure their retirement? It's coming up in maybe a decade, maybe a little bit less than that. So really have that why and that set of goals in mind as the first step. All right, very good. And how about selecting, uh, and I think it's part of the goal setting, is what type of asset class, um, where does that factor in? Should, they, should that be earlier on in the process or a little later on in the process? I think that should be a little bit later on in the process. I think the goals come first. I think in a second place would be the amount of involvement that you personally want to have in real estate investing. Are you looking, for example, to do this on the side or are you looking to start off perhaps part-time but then transition to doing it much more full-time? And there's an added component of that, assuming you are doing it full-time or even part-time, how much actual on-the-ground work do you yourself want to be doing? Do you want to be managing the properties? Do you want to be a landlord? Do you want to be walking door-to-door, for example, collecting rents? Or would you prefer to be much more hands-off, managing it from sort of a 20,000-foot view, so to speak, and looking at the numbers and hiring out teams to do all of that more ground-level work? I got you. So that's kind of like developing a strategy. I know for myself, uh, I am not a handy guy at all. I can't fix anything. And so in thinking about real estate investing I've done over the years, my strategy has always been not just the time element that's part of it, but also what my capabilities and what my strengths are, whereas somebody else might be a great tradesman where they could fix anything, put things together, or somebody else might be creative in terms of design work and architecture and engineering. But uh, you have to also align what you're doing, it seems to me, with um, what your strengths and abilities are as well as how much time you're going to put in. Is that a good way to look at it? It is. And, you know, I I think that another aspect that needs to be brought into this discussion is the fact that as you are looking at yourself, also keep in mind that real estate, as many, many of my guests have said, is a team sport. So as you do get into this, you are inevitably going to be having to reach out and bring other people on board and to build a team. And if you look at the people out there who really are the best in real estate investing, and when I say best, I mean the people who certainly you've heard of with the books, but also the people who are doing quite well for themselves but are not teaching courses, are not publishing books on investing. The people who are sort of the millionaire next door types who happen to have made much of their millions, accumulated much of their millions in real estate investing, those people are also building teams. So I imagine, uh, Nick, in your view, part of the goal setting and figuring out your time and involvement and then I added in what your capabilities are uh, so you develop kind of this strategy and then that lends itself to certain, uh, does that lend itself to certain asset classes? We talked at the beginning about the farmland, the storage, you could flip houses, you could buy income producing buildings, your clientele could be renters of, say, studio apartments or one-bedroom apartments, or you could do office buildings where your tenants might be businesses as opposed to individuals. Um, Walk me through a little bit of how you might try and figure out what asset class, what type of real estate you want to get involved in, at least some of the things that you want to consider to make a smart decision. Sure. Well, I think you certainly hit it just now with talking for example, about being handy and being good with tools. I'm not saying you were personally, because you've made it pretty clear that it's not your forte. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but for, for people, for people who are, if they are handy with tools and they like 
working on houses or building things, repairing things, that might lend itself well to doing a fix and flip. So focusing from an asset class perspective on single family houses, fixing them up, well, first off, buying them and acquiring them maybe through a tax auction on the courthouse steps or acquiring them through some other means, fixing them up and then flipping them. That might be their asset versus someone who's much more numbers focused might find themselves gravitating toward multifamily real estate as an example so they can crunch the numbers behind the deal and they might find that that higher level emphasis and multifamily's emphasis as well on economies of scale so you might be only earning a hundred dollars from one door door being a rental unit but a hundred dollars from one door but you're having a hundred units in a complex and that might that might fit much more into their ideal investment asset. And we see that too with people who are coming, for example, from a medical background. A lot of doctors go into multifamily real estate because they're much more numbers focused. A lot of former I bankers, investment bankers, people sure. who have been engineers too, mechanical engineers, going more into multifamily. No, that makes sense. And so, again, sticking with the theme, Nick, of somebody's looking to start out in real estate investing and uh, they've done everything that you've said and they look at, you know, how are they going to fund the purchase? Can you talk a little bit about that as they game plan what they're going to do? Yeah, that is a very, very important aspect of it. And as far as excuses go, money and time tend to be the two overwhelming things that cause people who might normally be able to get involved and do quite well to psych themselves out and to stay out of the game, unfortunately. With respect to the money aspect of it, the simple fact is that in many, many, many cases, there really isn't an obstacle if you're willing to get creative with real estate investing. And if you're willing to be creative then you can, in nearly all cases, get involved. And your involvement can be anything from as simple as with a house, wholesaling deals. So you get a property under contract with a house. You can do it with other asset types too. But with a house, and you don't even put any of your money in there, but you wholesale the deal. You secure a contract. And you're really just trading paper. So you wholesale sure. that property to someone else, and you earn a fee on that. And then if you do enough wholesale deals, you accumulate enough cash you can then, with that cash reserve, begin buying properties and scaling up from there. Okay, so just Versus, to catch, so let me just interrupt, just to catch everyone up who's listening. So a wholesale would be, in Nick's example, I may not have a lot of money, but uh, I'm willing to put sweat equity in. I may go out and find a house that is a good candidate to be flipped. I would get that property under contract, and then I would find someone that does have the resources and ability to carry through on the flip and then I would sell that contract to them and in, a, in essence I'm a middleman or a wholesaler and I never take control of the property I don't put money in but I facilitate the deal by creating the contract and then selling the contract to the actual flipper did I describe that okay you did and I would think that you would probably done a couple of them from the way you described it so well I actually have never wholesaled the deal, but um, but I'm familiar with it. And I should add, because this is the important point, is that the flipper would pay the wholesaler a finder's fee or some type of compensation for securing the deal because the flipper didn't have to go out and pound the pavement and find the deal. So they're um, getting a service from the wholesaler that they pay for in one way, shape, or form. Um, have you Have you done a wholesale deal? I have done wholesale deals. Yep. Okay. It's, uh, it's definitely one of the ways that I would recommend. All right. And so traditional fund purchases is, of course, someone could go out and borrow the money either from traditional sources or non-traditional sources. Uh, they could take money from, uh, if they have a bank account or investments, they could cash them in to fund the property. There's even a creative way you could do a self-directed IRA. It's not something that I do as a certified financial planner with LA Wealth Management. That's not really our forte. But you can go and use IRA or qualified money to access your retirement account to buy properties. That's kind of 
complicated. There's a lot of rules, but it can be done. Uh, you could also find someone, right, Nick? You mentioned earlier it's a team sport. So if, if you're, let's say, somebody who's hungry and has some good skill set and is willing to put in the uh, sweat equity, you could conceivably find that doctor you spoke about who would like to invest in real estate but might not have a lot of time, but they might be able to bring the funding in one way or another, and you could pair up. You must see a lot of that kind of partnership work, no? I do, yeah, and that type of a partnership <laughs> is referred to if you do it with multiple people and you get, bring on a number of investors is what's referred to as a syndication deal. So it's where you as an investor would go out and you would find, like you're saying, Chris, doctors, lawyers, perhaps, and other high net worth individuals, or even just people who had as a few thousand or maybe more than that, that they were willing to invest and to put into your deal. And then you would pull together their resources, allow them each to have an equity stake in your deal, and you would be in charge of putting in that sweat equity, as you mentioned, and running the deal and managing it for them. That would be one way. And I want to throw in, too, an, another type of financing arrangement you might do, which is a little bit more basic than some of the things we've been talking about, which is simply seller financing. Oh, yeah. Or, excuse That's a great me. example. Uh, uh, Owner financing, I guess, would be yes. the, the better way since you're the seller or since you're the buyer, rather. Owner financing, where you want, for example, to acquire an apartment building and you don't have the capital. Maybe you can get some loans and some financing to help you, but you're still not quite there. So you're able to negotiate terms with the person you're buying it from that in exchange for working at an arrangement with you, they'll give you a reduced amount but they're also earning cash flow each month from the sale and from the money you're providing them. So you can work out your own creative arrangement with them. Not everyone who's selling is going to be able to do that. They're not going to want to do that. Sure. But as I've heard from many of the people on my show and many of the people I've worked with on the book side, helping them put together their books, seller financing is one of those things that you don't know until you ask. And most investors, unfortunately, never think to ask. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've, I've done deals where I have acquired property and the seller and the owner has held the mortgage or held the paper for me. And I have also sold, in one instance, I sold the property and I held the note and then they paid me back. And I was with Nick, a, a very good client of mine in Florida a week or two ago, and uh, they had sold a home and they've been holding the mortgage for a very long time, and they love it. And we, we talked about this. Um, and one of the points that my client Marilyn and her husband Dick made was that, you know, real estate agents tend to hate those deals uh, because I'm not sure why, but you're right. If you learn about it and you ask and in the right situations, it could work out really, really well for both parties. I know in, in my case on – when I was on either side, in both instances, it worked out great for everybody involved. So I'm, gra I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that can be a really great way for you as well if you have a property, once you get it under contract, once you buy it, to actually get passive income from it without having the hassle of renters. If sure. you are able to structure one of those agreements with the person who's buying it from you, then you would be receiving a cash flow each month, but you're not having to as well go and worry about toilets, tenants, and termites, and all those other wonderful headaches that come with a rental property. Now, when we were talking, um, when we were talking offline before, uh, one of the things that we touched on was you know, how much money you're going to throw at this endeavor especially starting out, right? Because you, you do need to be careful. Um, and you referenced, uh, do you, I don't even know, I'll, ask, I'll put you on the spot. You referenced a very, very funny movie from years ago. Do you remember what movie you referenced? Yeah, it was The Money Pit. With, yeah. I believe it was Tom Hanks and that That's crazy right. rehab project that they did. Yeah, very funny, funny movie. Um, not so funny if you're a real estate investor. <laughs> But um, a classic movie, I think Shelley Long played, uh, played Tom Hanks' wife in the movie. But um, well, how would you speak to that in terms of how to, how to fund the purchase? How do you guard against ending into a money pit situation where things could kind of spiral out of control? There is risk in investing in 
any forms of these real estates, so you do need to be smart about it. Um, any guidelines you could give on preventing it from getting a little out of control with the budget and the money? Well, one of the things that I think is always good to keep in mind, and this is related to the specific area of raising capital, is that there will nearly always be things that you didn't anticipate. So if you are going into a project with money that you've raised from other people, you should always ask for more than you think you need just so that if one of these money pit situations does develop, sure. you don't have to then go back to your investors with your hand outstretched asking for more. Now, in terms of your question, though, more specifically, Chris, how can you guard against these type of money pit situations? One of the things I think that it was going to help right off the bat is to properly vet your contractors. So if you are working with people and having them do the handiwork in the project, really make sure that you vet them ahead of time and get to know how they work and their styles. Are they the types of people, for example, who like to go overboard on buying doors and various aspects of various equipment that they're going to be bringing to the property, things that they're going to install? Right. Or are they the people who like to cut corners? Because that could also harm you. If they buy shoddy materials that break in the middle of a job, that's going to drain more, uh, more money for the project. So make sure that you vet your contractors and really know who you're working with. Fair enough. That's good. And actually, I think that's good advice. If it's not real estate event and you have somebody coming in to do work in your place of business or in your home, how many stories have we all heard about people getting bamboozled and either having their money stolen or really shoddy treatment or uh, getting a quote only to find out the real bill is way higher. I think this, that's good universal advice you gave. Um, before we switch gears, last point on someone who's looking to start investing, what should they consider? Uh, what about the end game in terms of what do they want to get out of it? Do they want to have passive income? Do we, they want to just buy and sell the property? Um, how do you factor in what your end game is as part of this uh, strategy of getting involved in real estate? Well, you look at, as you were saying, what they want to be earning, first and foremost. If you want passive income, then you need to look at rental properties because rental properties of any form, whether that's traditional apartments or even houses that you're renting out or something like self-storage, where the tenants are paying you a fee every month to store their things there. That's going to be paying you passive income versus if you're looking for more of a long-term lump sum, then real estate that appreciates, which could be sold off sure. in the future, that might be more to your liking. Very good. Good. Um, so we, we talked about how to fund the purchase, and I'm, and I'm curious about this because – my thoughts on this subject have evolved quite a bit. I'm 48 now, and I've been a financial planner for 26 years, and I've been involved in a number of different sideline business opportunities over the years, including real estate investing. So I know this is a long wind-up, but my, my thoughts on debt have really changed and evolved over time. What are your views on, on using debt to buy properties? I know we touched on it a moment, but what do you think about that? Well, I think that in real estate, debt is certainly one of the most powerful things that you can use to acquire properties, but you have to be educated and you cannot rush into it at all. In terms of what you could use, there are some fantastic instruments out there. One of the ones that commonly comes up, and I hope this doesn't go too much over your listeners' heads and their understandings of it, but would be what's called an FHA loan. And that allows people, particularly now younger people on the millennial side, to get in to their first, say, four unit, first quad, or the first triplex, and begin to invest in multifamily real estate at a smaller level through what's called a house hack, which is basically where you live in one of the units in the property, and then you rent out the other three. And the FHA loan will help you to do that because it's for purchasing your primary residence. So if okay. the multifamily complex is your primary residence, you can use the loan for that. So that would be an example of debt being used positively. No, that's perfect. And not to talk 
too much about me. I mean, you may, hopefully don't come across as an egomaniac, but that's actually how I got started. Soon after college, starting my career, I bought a condo, not a quad or a duplex, but I bought a condo, a two-bedroom condo, and I rented out the other bedroom, but it was an awesome deal. I rented it out to my brother for a while. I rented it out to my best friend from high school for a while. I rented it out to a, another good friend of mine for a while, and they paid me rent, offsetting the mortgage, plus, this is not exactly a real estate investment comment, but these are my friends. If we hang out, we go you know, to restaurants together, drinking together, go meet people together. We'd watch f football on Sundays. It was fantastic. And then um, that's where I lived with my wife when we first got married. And then when we were ready to buy our first home, we moved to the first home, and then I rented the condo out completely. And when I think about the entry point to doing that, it, it wasn't very costly. And like you said, I went through traditional financing and got a first-time home buyer mortgage because I was occupying the property. It's a great way to get started, especially if you're younger looking to get into real estate investing and also home ownership in general. Great idea. Well, and Chris, what I also like about your example that you just mentioned is that it illustrates the value of scaling up, not trying to go right out the gate charging at a 30-unit apartment complex or right. not trying to just suddenly take down all these houses one after another, really working your way up gradually and slowly as it makes sense for you and your lifestyle. Yeah, and, and that, tying it back to the money pit example, um, I was able to handle the, the the cost of that condo on my own, so that on occasion, you know, my my friend might move out, they might move in with their girlfriend or get married, and you know, whatever the case is, and if that bedroom was empty, I was fine. It was preferable if I had a tenant in there or one of my friends in there, um, but it wasn't going to destroy me or cause harm to me if it wasn't so that was a good combination so let me ask you this because you've interviewed and connected with lots of real estate investors I think that comes across very clearly to my listeners but what I want to know is are there any traits and characteristics that you find in common with successful real estate investors that you've crossed paths with I think that one of the traits that I consistently see is a desire to improve themselves. And one of the reasons I say that is that at the end of nearly each episode that I do, I'll ask my guest about what sort of books they read. And almost always, the guest is able to name quite a few books in the areas particularly of self-development and personal improvement. And what I think is interesting about that is that it shows that they are continual learners and that they're really not satisfied with their current selves and always looking to improve. Very good. I, I know I have an appetite for that type of uh, reading, so that's, that's very good. Um, you know, on, on the show, my show, you know, often towards the back end, I, I just want to ask a little bit about your background and can you share with us, do, do, you grew up in an affluent household. What kind of household did uh, you grow up in? No, certainly not affluent. Um, definitely not, uh, not, nothing like the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, or any of those families of old. You're not a trust fund baby? Unfortunately or fortunately not. <laughs> and what did you learn about money growing up? That's an interesting question. I learned, of course, that money is important which I think uh, many of your listeners probably receive the same advice, sure. but uh, that money is the sort of thing that you need to constantly be working for. And I'm certainly no one by any means to discount the value of hard work. I think that's very, very important. But I think that in the area of money, it is important to realize too that once you put in a certain amount of work and move in this, a certain direction or directions, the money should begin to work for you. And that's something that, unfortunately, I didn't get too much guidance on. And so um, growing up like you did, and I think, um, uh, did you come up or do you have any money rules that provide a, a blueprint for you as you think about um, what you exchange your time for and what you're building towards? Do you have any money rules? 
That that is also another good question. One of the ones, thinking off the top of my head here, that would probably be good, would be the idea of a rule, really, don't be cheap. And what I mean by don't be cheap is that you should know the difference between being cheap and being efficient and budget-minded. So cheap would be, for example, we're talking about real estate, would be buying the cheapest possible doors that you can for a house that you're fixing up. Right. Just totally not even not even wanting to spend any more than you absolutely have to. Or, in another case, going as cheap as you possibly can on finding an attorney, someone to help you if you're incorporating with the LLC or another entity. Yeah, so just maybe, you know, yeah, trying to do it all... Because that may be cheap all, on you, the front end, but not the back end. Absolutely, yeah. So you, you think, you really think that you're being clever, and you think that, oh, you know, I'm saving a couple bucks, and it's really going to help. But then in the long run, and maybe in some cases it would work, maybe you really do manage to get it right. But in other cases, if you end up getting sued or, as often happens, you just miss something because you just don't know what you don't know, that kind of cheapness can really come back to bite you. Versus on the other side of that, we were talking about the other term, being cost-effective, being budget-minded, that is advisable. That is, for example, something as simple as when you leave your office, turn off the lights. Like It sounds so basic, but over time, that kind of an expense can just add up. Or if you are somewhere and you can walk and it makes sense to walk, then you might be better off health-wise walking or taking the stairs versus the elevator, that kind of thing. So know the difference between, really, between being smart with money and being dumb in an attempt to cut corners. Another Very example good. of being kind of money, I guess the proper phrase your listeners might have heard is penny wise, pound foolish, right? Yeah, yeah. So another example would be, and I've seen this, unfortunately, people who go to a coffee shop, they walk to a coffee shop a couple of blocks away from the office, they're there and it starts to rain. It doesn't just rain, it pours. So rather than spend a couple of bucks on a taxi cab to get back to the office, get right back to work, they're going to wait this thing out. That would be an example of really not thinking smart in terms of your money. Absolutely. That was very well said. Thank you. That was, that was an awesome answer. Uh, final question, and then maybe you could uh, fill our listeners in on how they might be able to uh, find out more about you and how you help real estate investors. But you're a 30-something now. Can you talk a little bit about how your views on money change now that you're a 30-something and you've been in the business world for a bit now? Yeah, I think that some of the ways my views have changed have certainly been on the need to invest in proper resources, whether that's what we were talking about with attorneys and materials, investing in education too. You know, Education is one of those things that seems like, oh, I can get it for free on the internet or I can just go to the public library. But in some cases, there really are resources out there that you need to invest in order to get access to, whether that's coaching or mentoring. And that would be one aspect of it. Certainly the whole cheap versus budget-minded thing we just talked about, that would be another thing. And so, then I so that's think something that evolved. Well, I'm sorry to cut you off. That's something that evolved. So the previous rule you had, as a 22-year-old, you might not have viewed it the same way as now. You know, it's 10 years later. I don't know exactly how old you are, but you've kind of grown into that attitude. It's not something that you came out of college with. No, it isn't. It really isn't. Uh, especially being in the sort of the coming from a more millennial background, in that I can just get this for free on the internet. And there's really that unfortunate view among many people who are on the younger side these days that they can just get things for free. And I'm, I, I'm not going to pay for that. Well, sometimes you actually do have to pay for stuff. And if you have to pay for stuff, oftentimes there's a reason for that because it really is valuable, especially in the case of education. Yeah, very well said. So thank you so much. This was as good a discussion as I had hoped for, Nick. Uh, very good information. I wish we had a lot more time as it probably comes across to you and listeners. This is an area I'm passionate about. I think it's fascinating and really important information. So thanks so much. For listeners that might want to get more information about uh, you, including your excellent podcast, how can they do so? Sure. 
the couple of places they could go, if they're interested in my book publishing service, where I help entrepreneurs and real estate investors to get their own book in just seven hours of their time, the best place to go for that would be contentcore.net, C-O-N-T-E-N-T, C-O-R-P-S dot net. And if they're interested in the podcast, which you yourself, Chris, are actually going to be a guest coming up, they yeah. can hear your episode and others at uh, Seven Rules for Real Estate Investing is the show name and sevenrulespodcast.com. Beautiful. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, for me, please know that you could go to www.elliotwealth.com to get information about my financial planning practice and the rest of the team that helps me help clients win with money. You could subscribe to the podcast there. We have a monthly mailing. You could also sign up for a complimentary initial consultation. So I will be back on an upcoming episode very soon. Again, Nick, thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Chris. Pleasure being on the show. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Point Financial. Simply Financial is part of the Exvadio Podcast Network. You can find Exvadio Podcasts at exvadio.com slash podcast, the Apple Podcasts app, iTunes Store, iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you find podcasts. So join us and stay informed and entertained.